Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the civil service examinations perspective. So today, we are going to discuss the Hindu Daily Edition dated 16th June 2023. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on your screen and time stamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now, let us begin our today's session. So first of all, there is an important announcement for all of you. Rao's IAS has launched 10 series for the Political Science and International Relations optional subject. There will be 8 tests in the test series and you will get a timely and detailed evaluation of your attempt. This whole program is going to be under the mentorship of Mr. Rahul Puri sir. You will get personal attention and can discuss your queries and doubts with the Rao's IAS teachers. There is a link in the description which has more details so you can join the program and boost your preparation for the mains exam. The second announcement is in relation to the mains revision classes. Rao's IAS will be conducting mains revision classes for 2023 mains exam. Many of you would be aware of the fact that these classes have boosted the performance of many top rankers in the past like Anandya Rashi, Namrata Chaube and Pooja Jha and helped them to score ranks in top 100. So, what will be the features of this program? First, there will be around 150 hours of live online classes which will help you in revising all the important themes of all subjects in question-answer discussion mode. Two, there will be unlimited one-to-one -one mentorship from teachers of Rao's IAS. Three, there will be a test series which will simulate the exam-like experience multiple times before you take the actual exam. Plus, timely and detailed feedback will help you to write your best answers. Four, you will also get all the notes from the teacher's classes to help you revise all the topics. There will be 4 hours of classes every day from Monday to Friday. Respected teachers like Mr. Baswa Open, Fezan Khan, Arun Bhardwaj, I, Gaurav Tripathi, Shashank, Vaibhav Mishra sir, Mr. Rankit Kaul and Mr. Jatin Bhardwaj are looking forward to help you get top ranks once more in 2023. So enroll for the course and boost your chances to score your best. There is a link in the description and you can know more by clicking on that. This is our first topic. This topic has appeared at page number 2 in today's The Hindu Daily Edition. Now despite the fact that this topic is in the local context but the issue is very important from our examinations perspective. The topic is in relation to the recent fire incident which broke out in the Mukherjee Nagar, the famous coaching area in the city of Delhi. As you can see, 61 students were reported to be injured and two were in critical situation. Now when the reporters asked the students, they said that faulty wiring, narrow lanes etc were the main causes behind the higher vulnerability of this particular area to the fire incidents. And this is the very immediate context of this article. Now when it comes to the UPSC's scheme of civil service examination, this topic finds its importance in General Studies Mains Paper 3 in the section of Disaster Management. Now it should be understand that whenever we talk about disasters and whenever we are preparing for the disaster management, we have to prepare for both the types of disasters, for example the natural disasters as well as the man-made disasters. Now, what are the natural disasters, for example, like earthquakes, tsunami, cyclones, etc. Man-made disasters include industrial disasters, fires, stampede, nuclear leakages, etc. So therefore, in today's session, we are going to deal with this particular type of disaster that is the civilian fires. Now, when we talk about the fire as a disaster, there are two important dimensions. One is the civilian fires or the industrial fires and second is the forest fires. Now both of these can be linked together also and they can be different also on certain parameters. However, in today's session we are going to restrict ourselves to the civilian disasters because the news has appeared in this very context only. So with the help of this flowchart we will in today's session learn that what are the various issues involved and what are the way ahead, what can be the policy directives or suggestions which we can write in our mains answer. So first let us understand that what are the various issues which are involved. So before starting this session you yourself brainstorm that what are the various issues involved 
that why certain regions are becoming more vulnerable to the fire disasters and the other areas are not there must be certain factors for this and those factors are the real issues for example if we talk about the present mode of urban development when we talk about certain planned cities for example chandigarh etc there we find that fire related disasters are relatively on a lower side however obviously no area is immune to such type of disasters but yes how urban development plays its role or the model of urban development plays its role in such type of disasters we all know that the population in the urban areas are continuously increasing according to certain reports by the world bank it is said in just few years india is going to surpass the urban population by 50% that is more than 50% of the total population of india will be living in urban areas the present data as far as india is concerned it shows that around 35% of the population lives in urban area however world bank also says that there is an phenomena of hidden urbanization now what do you mean by hidden urbanization basically the hidden urbanizations are those people living in urban areas but are not recorded for example unregulated slums so our census measures only those areas which are recorded which are there in the government papers but then we all know that that data is always lower than the real data so if we take the hidden urbanization into account it says that even already around 52 to 55% population is living in the urban areas so the point is that the population density in the cities is continuously increasing and this point is very important not only from the perspective of fire related disasters but others also if the population density in any particular area is increasing that means that the chances of deaths or the chances of losses is also increasing second in most of the large urban areas there are always certain regions which are unregulated for example the peri urban areas the rural areas the slums areas etc so these areas which are near to certain urban centers or far away they are mostly unregulated even in the urban areas when we have the building bylaws but they are not properly implemented or followed so just think the areas where there are not even any bylaws how will we implement those bylaws in those areas so these areas are always unregulated they are neglected regions and hence the vulnerability of such areas also increases second in the urban areas the city centers there are closely spaced buildings again whenever the buildings are closely spaced so obviously you can understand that if this building particularly catches fire it will be immediately transferred to this then to this then to this and the tragedy will increase multifold further when we talk about the urban agglomerations for example delhi mumbai bangalore etc where we do find high rise apartments these high rise apartments further increase the vulnerability to the fire the reason being it becomes very difficult for the fire fighters to reach to the topmost floors of these buildings second it also becomes very difficult for the flat owners in those areas to come down very fast there are lack of exit routes so all these reasons make such high rise apartments or closely spaced buildings very vulnerable so to understand this you should keep in mind that the present model or the present pattern of the urban development is inviting such types of disasters right even if you go by this newspaper article what the students are saying students are saying that the faulty wiring narrow lanes etc are responsible for this disaster right now we shall move towards our second point presently the fire fighting strategy is more reactive response oriented okay it is not still a proactive approach in india which means that whenever any area catches fires only then the civilian or the people living in those areas become active and then they feel that this type of disaster must also be tackled but until and unless that disaster broke in any region till then 
people do not pay any attention to this particular type of disasters right so that is why all the buildings the coaching institutions the it locations it establishments schools colleges hospitals etc they do not focus on these things you yourself think have you ever heard about fire engineering no do we people focus towards fire audit no do we think about capacity building no are we adequately aware that how to fight a fire there must be certain fire extinguishers in your building or the areas where you live or you go or you study so how many of you are aware how to use these fire extinguishers so this is the point right we always believe in the reactive response but we tend to forget about the proactive approach these things must be taken care of the third issue is the inadequate capacity to fight with such disasters okay so here we have understood so here we learned that mostly our response is reactive but even when it comes to the reactive response we do not have adequate capacity we do not have adequate number of fire brigades we do not have fire fighters the personnel the staff then we also have absence of the water storage water tanks near these areas and we all know that water is the primary tool to help in such types of disasters obviously water cannot be directly spread on the areas without knowing the cause that why fire broke out because it can be due to the electric fuses or shocks etc so in those so in those cases obviously we cannot apply the water then building bylaws yes we do have building bylaws but are we able to enforce it no are we implementing it no then there is a lack of coordination between various agencies between various departments etc so all these reasons point out the fact that despite we believe in reactive response still we do not have adequate capacity take up that response fourth issue comes with the climate change we all know that there is a general increase in temperature further when we come to the urban areas the average temperature of these urban areas are relatively 2 to 3 degrees celsius more compared to the surrounding rural areas and this phenomena is known as the heat island effect so if any particular city or urban areas are having high temperature then obviously there are higher chances that it will catch fire the increase in temperature is also creating the forest fires is also setting up the agricultural fields on fires in the rural areas so again this climate change is also becoming one of the most important issues and last is certain issues which are related to the modern days for example the data centers the data centers utilize a huge amount of energy which in turn can lead to fire break multi level parkings in cities metro rails the transportation networks as well as the lithium batteries which today we are using in the electric vehicles you must have gone through this news that a lot of electric vehicles caught fire in last few months because these batteries are getting heated up and they are catching the fire so these are certain issues which relate to our modern day lifestyles but yes we have discussed all these issues but the question is that upsc will ask you that what can be a way ahead what are your suggestions you are going to be the administrator so obviously you should know the solutions to these issues also so now let us discuss the way ahead so while giving the suggestions or thinking of the way ahead you can divide into four compartments one will be the fire prevention and risk mitigation second will be the relief from disaster third will be the technology and fourth will be the institutional reform so let us look at these closely so there are certain components when it comes to the fire prevention and risk mitigation that means the proactive approach the issue which we discussed in the last slide so we need to focus on proactive approach how to do that one the building permissions and the fire regulation there must be synchronized with each other there must be sync between these two things second there should be a judicious 
use of materials while designing the buildings for example we should avoid glass foam plastic boards etc in today's buildings because these materials catch fire very fast then comes the educating the users we first and foremost responsibility of you is you should understand how to use fire extinguisher at least this you can learn in yourself okay so we need not to pass on every responsibility to the state there are some personal responsibilities also so learn to use this however coming to the state states must invest in adequate awareness generation program as well as the capacity building and sensitization programs next is the incorporation of the best practices the fire fighting institutions the governments must understand that what are the global best practices and must incorporate them in our national or the district level policies then there must be a continuous and regular safety audits fire audits in all the institutions and the policies or the laws must be revised on frequent basis so as to deal with the new and emerging challenges right second we will see about the reactive response that is the relief from the disaster how to focus on it one increase the number of fire stations increase the number of water storage tanks increase the personnel or staff similarly we must focus on innovative funding mechanism because we know that our fire fighting institutions face the challenge of financial crunch we also know that government solely cannot meet the needs of everything so we can go for the ppp mechanism for example we can make this as an essential component of the corporate social responsibility government must also focus on capacity building of the personnel involved the ndrf the state disaster response forces etc they can be utilized and can bring synergy between such institutions the third thing is that government must also focus on the technological aspects because technological upgradation is very must given the nature of this particular type of disasters and therefore we must invest heavily in the water mist drones robots handheld lasers now this robotics is very important if we are able to develop robots let's say which can clean the manholes if we are able to develop robots which can go to the sea bed which can invest corals which can invest mangroves etc then obviously we can and we must invest in robotics so that even the fire fighting can be done by the robots so as to not just tackle the deaths related to the civilians but also to lessen the possibility of deaths or the life losses in the context of the fire fighters if robot is going to tackle and if the robot dies then obviously it is not an issue but while fighting the fire if fire fighter dies then obviously it is a very big issue right next comes the institutional reforms so government must focus on center state coordination interagency coordination as well as intra agency coordination inter agency coordination is basically between different agencies for example fire services hospitals police etc intra agency coordination is among the departments of the fire services so this can be a way ahead which you can suggest in your answers so this was a pretty lengthy topic let us revise this topic in brief once again the topic has appeared in today's newspaper the hindu at page number 2 in relation to the fires in the mukherji nagar of delhi a famous coaching area so in this context we discuss that what are the various issues involved in this for example the present pattern of urban development characterized by high population density unregulated growth as well as closely spaced buildings second issue which we discussed is that we are highly focused towards a reactive response but not the proactive ones we are not aware about the fire audits or even how to use the fire extinguishers the third issue is the inadequate capacity of the state in terms of the numbers of fire brigades personnel water sources building bylaws coordination etc then 
the issue is related to climate change which is increasing the temperature further increases the instances of civilian fires and last we discuss the issues related to the modern day lifestyles for example the lithium batteries in the electric vehicles so in last in this regard we discussed about the fire prevention and risk mitigation strategies so under this we must focus on the proactive response bringing a sync between the building permissions as well as fire regulation judicious use of materials as well as educating the users then for the reactive response we must focus on increasing the number of fire stations personnel water storages etc we can also go towards the funding mechanisms promoting the ppp as well as the capacity building of the personnel the government must also invest in technological measures giving special attention to the robotics and last bringing the institutional reforms in order to have the coordination at the center state and district level at the inter agency level as well as the intra agency level so these are the points which will help you to write the means answer in a holistic manner now this topic has appeared at page number 10 in today's the hindu delhi edition and has appeared as a lead article as you can read the headline of this topic which reads that reflections on artificial intelligence as friend or foe so as this title is clearly signaling us that this topic here in today's newspaper is discussing the merits as well as the demerits of artificial intelligence and that is why in today's session we are going to discuss about these certain dimensions as far as the upsc scheme of syllabus is concerned this topic finds its relevance mainly in general studies mains paper 3 that is science and tech section however from the same scheme of syllabus we can also identify this topic in general studies mains paper 4 that is the ethical perspective so in today's session what we are going to do is that we will cover the broad merits and demerits from the gs paper 3 perspective we will brief about them and also in detail we will be discussing the ethical dimensions of artificial intelligence because this is one of those areas which generally get neglected right so now let us have a brief overview of various applications of artificial intelligence we all know that what is artificial intelligence and we also know the various sectors in which the artificial intelligence can play its role let's say in education artificial intelligence can transform the education by providing the personalized learning experiences right so it can give us the personalized experiences similarly it can also help in developing the intelligent tutorial sessions and it can also frame the adaptive educational content similarly in healthcare also we know that the artificial intelligence can help in improving the diagnostics for example the researches are being conducted in the sphere of ai enabled medical imaging right similarly in the healthcare sector the ai has its high relevance for the personalized treatments in the agriculture sector also ai can help us to understand the moisture level in the soils it can help in developing the precision farming it can also help to determine the crop yield and the forecast in terms of any natural disaster which might hamper the crop productivity to develop the infrastructure also the artificial intelligence has its own role for example if india is planning to develop smart cities so don't you think that this artificial intelligence can help us to lay down better transportation networks don't you think that this artificial intelligence by analyzing various data which we will provide the machines but by learning from those data themselves these machines can help us to design the transportation lanes which will be devoid of congestion so these are the areas where artificial intelligence can play its role in infrastructure similarly in data analysis and research for example in the field of space in the field of defense etc artificial intelligence has its huge role AI can further be used for counter cyber attacks 
That means AI has its role in national security also. With the help of certain sensors, AI can help to detect the poaching, border intrusions, as well as human trafficking. Similarly, AI is useful in the areas of service delivery. For example, you must have heard about the news that during COVID, in certain areas of the world, robots were used to deliver the med medicines when there was a lockdown. So robots were used in order to deliver the medicines to the doorsteps. So this is the potential of artificial intelligence and also in the terms of environmental sustainability. So we all are aware about these multifold applications of AI. But then there are certain challenges also. For example, you might have heard about the term deep fakes. So artificial intelligence nowadays is also being used to manipulate certain things and to transfer the misinformations or disinformations. For example, this deep fakes. Similarly, AI can also lead to privacy violations. For example, it can analyze the personal data. And the very practical example is whenever we download certain apps in our mobile phones, we give certain permissions to those apps to access the microphones or etc. And without reading anything, we give those permissions. So don't you think that AI can misuse all those permissions which we have given AI can collect the data, the personal data which are there in our mobile phones, for example, certain videos, certain photographs, etc. So the experts have said that AI can lead to huge privacy violations. Similarly, let's say if 10 people were doing one job and now because of artificial intelligence, because of the robotics, etc., one AI based machine is able to process a lot more data compared to which these 10 people were doing. So just try to think the potential losses of jobs which AI can bring. So there can be a large scale unemployment also. Yes, we do agree with the fact that there will be generation of employment also in other sectors which will be supporting the artificial intelligence. So on the employment part, it can be positive as well as negative. But here because we are dealing with the challenges, so yes, there are chances of unemployment because of artificial intelligence. The coding which is being done to generate these AI based tools are so complex that even the creators or the developers of those codes or those softwares are unaware about them. So it creates a lot of problem in terms of transparency as well as accountability. Similarly, the automation of weapons pose a huge challenge to the global peace and security. And in this relation, there is another aspect of cyber security because AI enabled tools can themselves lead to various cyber attacks across the world. So now whom you are going to arrest because it was not a person, it was just a machine which conducted that attack. And out of all those concerns, the last remaining concern is the ethical issues which is posed by the artificial intelligence. So now in this session, we are going to discuss this particular dimension in detail that what are various ethical issues from the perspective of gender studies mains paper four and are there any recommendations in this regard or not. So now we will carry a session from the ethical dimensions of artificial intelligence. So let us understand that how these new technologies like artificial intelligence are leading to those ethical concerns. The first issue is that several experts believe that artificial intelligence is going to rise the existing inequality across the world. This inequality might be the case of developed versus developing countries. It might be rich versus poor or it might be company versus the state. Let us understand this. Now all these technologies are highly capital intensive in nature and that is why most of the times the ownership of these technologies are with the rich people. Now this rich can be an individual person or this can be a developed country or this can be a multi billionaire company. So what will happen is that if the ownership are restricted in the hands of developed countries, rich individuals or the companies, 
the ones who will suffer will be the developing or the ldcs the poor people or the state now this dimension is very important because there are certain companies whose annual incomes or profits are way larger than the gdp of certain states in africa from this we can understand that the impact which this company can make over those smaller states while negotiating certain corporate deals which in the long run will be detrimental for the overall socio economic as well as ecological status of that particular country next issue is the environmental issue now these technologies are energy intensive it is believed that the technologies which are used in artificial intelligence consume around 10% of the total global energy which is used in the technological sector this is a very high consumption and hence that can be detrimental on the ecology and environment third issue is related to the gender data suggests that just 22% of the total workforce employed in this particular sector is represented by women so this gender skewed nature of the workforce in this sector reflect the gender biases also more importantly have you ever wondered that why are the personal assistant devices always have female tones for example siri alexa so all the personal assistant devices have predominantly female voice so in a way this artificial intelligence technology is concretizing the existing gender stereotypes in our society further we all know that with coming of these modern technologies which can do a work of hundreds of individuals in few seconds there are high chances that the unemployment rate will drastically increase and the last issue is obviously related to the privacy concerns today when we use google youtube etc there is a mad race going on across the world to collect the consumers data and we while using all these applications unknowingly or knowingly are giving our data to these multinational companies and then we do not have any control on our own data once we have given that data away so there are high privacy concerns associated with the artificial intelligence technology also in this very regard there are important recommendations given by unesco the first important recommendation is in relation to protecting the data the unesco recommendations 2021 says that individuals must be the owners of their own data and they shall be given accessibility to either preserve or even erase the records of their personal data they must be given the right to erase their records also further it recommends to increase the ability of the regulatory bodies around the world to enforce this particular right the second recommendation is in the regard that unesco says that the member states should consider that ultimate responsibility and accountability must always lie with the humans that means that the technology must not replace the humans and these artificial intelligence technologies should not be given legal personality themselves for example tomorrow if you ask certain information under your right to information act then the government cannot say that this was done by some robot and that is why we are not accountable for that no legal personality must not be given to these technologies and the ultimate accountability must lie with the humans the third important recommendation is in regard to monitor and evaluate the performance for this the unesco says that ethical impact assessment has to be developed which will compare the countries and their steps which are taken in order to analyze all the ethical impacts of artificial intelligence technologies further the member states should also consider adding the role of an independent artificial intelligence ethics officer so this person will be overall authority dealing with such scenarios the terminologies can be different in different countries however the basic idea is that for this specific issue there must be some dedicated authority to regulate it and last recommendation is in regard to protecting the environment the recommendations incentivizes the government to invest in green technologies and to use artificial intelligence technologies in only those scenarios whereby we have concrete data that this technology does not have disproportionate 
नेगेटिव इम्पैक्ट ऑन द एनवायरमेंट सो दीज आर द मेजर यूनेस्कोज रिकमेंडेशन फॉर हैविंग एथिकल यूज ऑफ आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस टेक्नोलॉजीज इन द मॉडर्न वर्ल्ड एंड यू कैन यूटिलाइज दीज रिकमेंडेशन इन योर आंसर्स एथिक्स पेपर एज वेल एज एस ए पेपर नो दिस इमेज हैज अपियर एट पेज नंबर इलेवन द टाइटल ऑफ दिस इमेज इज पोकली द राइज ऑफ द फ्यूचर नो देर इज नॉट मच टेक्स्ट रिटर्न अबाउट दिस इमेज इन टूडेज न्यूज पेपर बट वेन एवर यू आर रीडिंग न्यूज पेपर्स ऑलवेज डू हैव अ वेरी क्लोज लुक ऑन सर्च इमेज बिकॉज दिस इमेज इफ इट हैज मैंशन द नेम ऑफ दिस इम्पॉर्टेंट राइस एंड विद द टाइटल that it is a rice of the future then obviously it becomes very important to understand that which breed of rice it is and why is it called as the rice of the future are there any certain important key facts related to this particular variety of rice is there any specific region in which this is grown so all these key facts important for our prelims examination more importantly when it comes to the section of biodiversity or the agriculture so that is why in this context we will discuss certain key facts related to the pokalli variety of rice first of all before starting it let us see the map of kerala because this has this because this variety of rice is grown in certain areas only it is not widespread across all india it is just grown in three districts of kerala this is the map of kerala and if you see here we have a district known as alapua here we have ernakulam and this is thrissur all these three are the coastal districts on their western side we have the arabian sea so in this coastal area this rice is grown again thrissur ernakulam and alapua now here we also have one important region that is kutanad area now kutanad area spreads across certain districts like alapua certain sections of alapua certain sections of kottayam and certain sections of pathanam thitta so we can say that kutanad area in alapua is common okay so kutanad is there in alapua and this pokalvi rice is thrissur and nakulam and alapua right now we shall look at certain key facts first of all we should understand that traditionally the coastal wetlands in many parts of india have been used for sequential paddy fish cultivation okay so the sequential paddy fish cultivation that is in one season the farmers are growing paddy and sequentially in the second season they are having fish farming that is aquaculture so this sequential manner of this thing is practiced in many parts of india and in different state it is known by different names in kerala it is pokalli however in recent times it has been witnessed that pokalli cultivation is on decline why it is on decline we will look at those reasons also first let us understand that what is basically a pokalli rice it is a variety of rice which is salt tolerant obviously if the variety is growing in the coastal wetlands which is exposed to the saline sea waters then obviously that variety has to be salt tolerant second it is an indigenous variety which is grown in three districts salapua thrissur and ernakulam this is a lesser known variety we only know about the basmati rice this is very less known variety developed in the low lying coastal areas but it employs one of the oldest organic farming techniques now again this is important it is organic in nature pokalli is basically a system in which farming alternates between rice and prawn so these fields are used alternatively for rice farming and prawn or shrimp cultivation it does not use any fertilizers whether chemical or organic because it is grown in water logged areas and even if some fertilizers are applied to it it will be washed away by the sea waves so it does not have fertilizers it is purely organic grown in water logged areas and this is famous for its medicinal qualities it has its peculiar taste and has a very high protein and fiber content important very important 
This has also been conferred a geographical indication tag in 2008. But we discussed that the decline in Pokalli cultivation has certain reasons and those reasons are shortage of skilled labor because now people are migrating from those areas in search of other employment options. So there we have a shortage of skilled labor. We also have lack of technology because in such high density waterlogged areas mechanization is not very feasible. There is a soggy soil, tractors cannot move, so there is a lack of technology. Low crop prices also because the demand is higher for basmati variety of rice. So if demand is for any other variety, the price will also be for that variety only. And then there is disturbance, encroachment of the marine and estuarine coastal ecosystem. So all these factors are the challenges which this particular Pokalli cultivation system is facing in Kerala. So initially we discussed that uh, such type of sequential farming practices occur in other areas also. For example, in West Bengal, this agriculture fishery integration is known as bheris. Similarly, in Karnataka, it is known as gajini. In Goa and Maharashtra, it is known as Kazan and in Kerala, it is Pokalli, right? So such type of factual information are important because in prelims examination, the question can be asked in the form of matching the columns. So again, I'm repeating it. In West Bengal, Bheris. In Karnataka, Gajni. In Goa and Maharashtra, Khazan. And in Kerala, Pokalli. Now, initially, we also talked about a Kuttanath area, which, so this area is basically covering Alapua, Kottayam and Pathanamthitta districts. You can see in this map, this is Alapua, this is Kottayam and this is Pathanamthitta. Now, why this area is important? This area is important because, because here we have below the sea level farming system developed and this is recognized by the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, as globally important agricultural heritage system now this is very important fact right so it is having a unique practice of cultivating the rice below the sea level and that is why it is globally important agriculture heritage system by food and agricultural organization in Kuttanath area in Kerala okay so these were the important key facts related to this particular image which has appeared in today's newspaper. This topic has appeared at page number 11 in today's The Hindu Delhi edition and is in relation to the BIMSTEC. Important key term is mentioned in this article that is Bangkok Vision 2030. Obviously it is going to be signed at the next summit so details will come later but as far as now is concerned because it has appeared in today's newspaper so we should be aware that what is this Bangkok Vision 2030 all about and with which organization is it associated? So this is the very context of this article that BIMSTEC which stands for Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation at the end of this year will adopt the Bangkok Vision 2030. So from the prelims perspective under this topic two things are important. One, what is Bangkok Vision 2030 and second, what are certain key facts associated with the BIMSTEC. So that is why it is going to be a very short discussion. Let us understand these things. BIMSTEC Bangkok Vision 2030 basically aims to build prosperous, resilient and open PRO that is pro BIMSTEC by 2030. So this is an acronym. Remember it. And therefore this vision sets a clear direction and priorities as well as goals for the BIMSTEC collaboration to tackle the challenges and seize the opportunities for the coming decade. Obviously, more details will come once it is into force. But the question important is that Bangkok Vision 2030 is associated with which regional organization? So it is BIMSTEC. Now let us look at the certain key facts related to the BIMSTEC. We have discussed that this is a regional organization. It was established in 1997, but an important years are 97 as well as 1998. The reason being in 1997, 
when this organization came into being it did not have the seven members initial members were bangladesh india sri lanka and thailand and that is why at that point of time this organization was known as BISTEC that is Bangladesh India Sri Lanka Thailand Economic Cooperation however few months later with the admission of Myanmar Bhutan and Nepal this came to known as BIMSTEC so remember three countries that is Myanmar Bhutan and Nepal joined later they were not the founding members further next year during the second bimstec ministerial meeting six priority areas were identified for the bimstec cooperation trade and investment transport and communication energy technology tourism and fisheries however after that in 2004 this was expanded to cooperate in the fields of poverty alleviation agriculture cultural cooperation counter terrorism and transnational crimes environment and disaster management public health and people to people contact so presently there are 13 sectors because the organization is the multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation so how many sectors present 13 sectors in this line let us look at certain other key facts the bimstec region basically accounts for 22% of the world population and this shows the sheer significance of this organization especially in the asian region the south asia as well as the south east asia it has a combined gdp of around 2.7 trillion dollars and because these countries are the rim countries of bay of bengal they have their own strategic significance the reason being the one fourth of the world's traded goods cross this bay every year so this was started with signing of the bangkok declaration in 97 so again bangkok declaration for bimstech and bangkok vision 2030 again for bimstech so these were certain key facts related to this topic so that is all for today all the very best and study hard